afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome to the second of two webinars on physics of failure reliability methods. Uh, we will be starting in approximately two minutes just to give the stragglers time to filter in. All right. Okay, everybody, once again, welcome to uh, the second of two webinars on Introduction uh, to Physics of Failure Reliability Methods. Uh, Dr. Randy Schuler will be taking it from here, uh, and I uh, hope you enjoy it. Thank you. Well, hello, everybody. As uh, Ed said, my name is Randy Schuler. I'm a senior member of technical staff at DFR Solutions, and uh, welcome uh, this afternoon. Um, yeah, we'll, we'll be discussing physics of failure, reliability methods. Uh, a little bit about myself. I'm located here in uh, in Minneapolis, Minnesota. While the rest, most of the rest of the company, DFR, is uh, is in uh, Bellsville, Maryland. Uh, we also have people scattered about the country. Uh, you know, make sure we, we we've covered uh, lots of different areas. Uh, I, I started, you know, my, my PhD in materials science engineering, and uh, and I got into electronics immediately. Out of grad school, went to 3M company. Uh, spent a lot of time developing products there. Um, in, in the electrical and the electronic products division, and then uh, moved to a, a company called Extreme Devices, where I was uh, engineering director of a uh, of something we, we made NEMS type devices at the time, and uh, and then five years as senior manager of component engineering and failure analysis at Dell Computer. So uh, long long history in the electronics industry, dealing with a lot of failures, a lot of problems. Uh, you know, anytime you're developing a product, a big part of your job is is uh, reliability, you know, testing and, and failures and so on. So, um, DFR Solutions, we, uh, we, we work in failure analysis, uh, you know, helping companies not just find failures and determine what they are, but also help root cause them and, and help resolve you know, whatever that issue might be, um, you know, really, really take it upstream as, as far as we can to the actual process. And then uh, also help with all the other areas of reliability uh, of electronics as well. Everything from um, component level to, to PCBs to uh, completed assemblies and testing and so on. So that's, that's uh, me and, and our company DFR. Uh, as an agenda, we'll start with... Uh, Overview of physics of failure and design for reliability. Talk about them and their importance. The and then discuss the some of the limitations of the traditional ways of uh, doing design for reliability. Get into some more of the future methods uh, of modeling failure mechanisms on printed circuit board assemblies. And then uh, I'll end with some some slides on physics of failure and reliability testing. 
you know, how do we incorporate and, and marry the two of those? So what is design for liability? It's a measure of product's ability to perform a specified function, whatever that might be for your product, at the customer in their use environment, which as we know can be a, a pretty wide range of, of, of environments, you know, from what, what people actually use their products. And then over the, the desired lifetime, I had that circled because um, it's important to understand that uh, you have a warranty period but each of your customers has their own expectation for for how long the product will should survive in, in their environment. Uh, design for reliability. It's a process for ensuring the re the uh, reliability of the product or system during the during the design stage, and that's a critical critical portion here uh, before physical prototypes. So we like to think of it as everything that you do for your product before you actually build anything. Everything that, that you can do to make sure that that product is going to be robust in the user environment. Now, physics of failure. This is a term that's been around for a while. It, it essentially means, and, and w the way we define that DFR solutions is the, is the leveraging of, of a broad base of knowledge and understanding of the processes and me mechanisms that induce failures to predict the reliability and improve the product performance. So um, it, it's physics, it's material science, it's chemistry, it's, it's a, a good understanding of how components are built, how boards are assembled, um, and, and so on. All that experience and knowledge um, being put to the purpose of, of understanding why things fail. And in the Army and in NASA, their definitions are relatively similar. They, they do bring in the, the point of computer-aided engineering uh, to help find root cause and, uh, you know, and, and so on. So it's, you know, uh, and the last point there is physics of failure. It's, it's an important component of DFR. You know, you can have DFR without physics of failure, but physics of failure makes it much more um, um, valuable and and, uh, and and important. It makes it m much more useful, I should say. So, why is DFR important? Uh, you've probably seen similar slides to this. So, try to emphasize the the fact that that uh, most of the cost of your of the total cost of your product is 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 built in early in the development cycle in your concept, feasibility, design, development, those portions don't take a lot of, of the time um, in your life cycle, but they determine much of the cost. You know, whether you're going to have warranty issues and whether your product's going to be difficult to produce and, and, and so on. Uh, another way to look at it is, uh, is the overall cost. Uh, the design can perhaps cost as little as five percent of your or your total development cost, but it influences somewhere around seventy percent of the final product cost. So it's a it's a not very big cost up front, but it has a big influence, and therefore it's obviously an area that uh, a company should focus more effort on. If you can. Maybe increase that to seven percent, and, and and you know you, you're getting much uh, a lot of bang for your buck, so to speak, um, when you're putting more effort into doing a, a good design. Another way to look at it is uh, the cost of failures, and so this is the cost of unreliability. Meaning, uh, a failure at concept stage is relatively cheap to fix. It's just a quick sketch or design change. Um, once you're in the design stage, it's a little bit more. Maybe you're starting to get some tooling uh, built, and you have to change things there. You know, validation and production um, obviously much more expensive to fix problems. Uh, now you may have machinery that might have to change, or you may have to redesign the whole product, or change components, or you know, there's all kinds of things that may influence. And and obviously. Um, Failures at a customer location, you know, it, it, that starts to cost your, uh, um, your your company from the standpoint of just uh, your your 
confidence in your co in your company. So there's obviously a, from this slide um, much room for improvement with respect to reliability. There's a lot of this uh, consumer reports list shows just a number of different types of products, uh, can mostly consumer products, and and uh, the fact that the failure rates are relatively high for the first three years. And with each of these failures is a, a dissatisfied customer and, and a fair amount of cost for repairs to the, to the company. Uh, this gives a quick indication of desired lifetimes of various products. Um, so you have a feel for what customer expectations might be um, on the products that, that you build. So how has design, design for Reliability been traditionally performed? It's, um, you know, a lot of it, frankly, has been trial and error. And, uh, you know, the more fancy name is Design, Build, Test, Fix. So you design the product, you build some samples, you test them, you find problems with them, and you repair and fix and perhaps redesign. Um, lessons learned is another form of that where maybe you've been in the you know, producing products for some time and you keep a list of mistakes that may have been made uh, and keep those handy as a checklist for new engineers who come on board and don't want to you don't want them making you know similar mistakes again. Uh, FMEA is a common kind of technique that's uh, uh, used to help identify potential areas of concern. It has some value. It does not help you with necessarily root cause or, or calculations. MTBF uh, is an older form. Uh, it's still around. I mean, no, no handbook uh, 217. It's a um, way of finding, calculating based on components what your overall mean time before failure would be. And I'll talk a little bit more about that here in a minute. And uh, some folks rely uh, completely on industry standard test methods. They, they pick a couple test methods from a book and they test in their product and they, if they pass, they consider them good and ship them out the door. Design, build, test, and fix is uh, kind of shown here. It's, you know, it's it works, but it's not. Uh, uh, a lot of engineers get gray hair over this sort of methodology, where you design it, you build it, and you just put it into test, and you're hoping, you know, white knuckled that uh, this thing passes testing, and you can ship it on its release date in, in, in like two weeks. And obviously, if something breaks in test, then um, you have to, you know reschedule and rework and do whatever it takes to to, to get the product out the door um, and so it obviously would be much better if you when you designed the product you were very confident that it was going to pass all of your tests um, and if there was some issue it, they, they would be you know, small issues not something large a lot of these OEMs they spend uh, a great deal of time on this cost uh, 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 time and cost on the test fail fix uh, methodology um, while the initial design aspect portion of it is is relatively small so um, obviously what you know main point of my presentation is we, we need to reduce that the test failure fix cycle reduce that spend maybe a little bit more time on your initial design and, and do it right and, and provide the right tools to enable a good initial design. So uh, to kind of summarize, there's been really too much emphasis on techniques like FMEAs and uh, fault tree analysis type uh, you know, tools. They're, they're, they, they do have value. I've used these in the past. Um, they're good for brainstorming and so on. But uh, you can't solely, solely rely on these, these things alone. Halt uh, and failure analysis. Um, really a lot of these tests, again, good tests, uh, but they're really not part of DFR because it's too late. At that point, you've already built product and you're testing it. You, you do much better to design it in a point, uh, 
design it with confidence that it will pass those tests. Uh, and an over-reliance on MTBF calculations. So what is an MTBF calculation? There are these 217 type uh, standards. Well, what it does is it looks at uh, the reliability of the components themselves. So if you have, a say, an electrolytic capacitor, you look in a table and it says, well, the, here's the reliability, the MTBF of that capacitor. And you get to pick whether it's a good one, you know, uh, good, moderate, or bad, or whatever it might be. And then uh, and it'll add up all those capacitors and you know, along with all the other components and, and come up with an overall MTBF for your assembly. Um, problem is it's, it, um, there's a lot of fudge factors involved. So you can end up with uh, results that are uh, very greatly. And it doesn't take into account wear out issues. So solder joints, um, mechanical failures, any of those things are not generally taken into account. So one university actually did a comparison. They looked at products that had been in the field a long time, so they knew what the MTBFs actually were, and then they compared them to what the calculated MTBFs were, and got just a huge variation. Some overestimate, some some underestimated by, you know, many hundreds of percent uh, off. So really, you know, it ended up with, with the point that it there's such a big difference, it really is not all that uh, a meaningful predictor. And as I say in the little box on the left there, it, it's only looking at components, not looking at uh, the assembly, the solder joints, the PCB itself. Uh, mechanical stresses, and so on. And for that reason, a lot of uh, places, the Army, for example, has said that, you know, MTBS really is not something you should you should be using or reporting even on, on, uh, for various products for the military. All right, so what are some elements of the best practices for DFR? Um, first of all, build a solid DFR team and provide them with the right tools. And, and, and do this, obviously, early in the design cycle. You know, sometimes you may start with one or two people with an initial design, and that's fine. But once you, you're committed to something, um, you really need to staff that up with a cross-functional team. And um, understand the primary wear out failure modes in, in electronics, and, you know, incorporating this physics of failure type methodology, and specifically for your products. If you have history in your field, you, you know what typically fails. You may have old Pareto charts around that you can look at and, and understand what the main uh, areas of concern are. Uh, number three, have a good understanding of the environment that the product is going to go into. And that involves the qualification testing it has to undergo, the shipping, storage conditions, and of course the user environment. All these will have an impact, and all these should be accounted for when you're uh, designing the product. Perform modeling of these failure mechanisms in the expected environments. So I'll spend quite a bit of time on this, but it means, um, you know, there's a tool now that you can actually use to model a printed circuit board assembly uh, through all of these environments and have a much better understanding of how it's going to perform. And that's where this uh, virtual testing comes in. You know, with a model, you can virtually test your assembly and uh, have a good level of confidence it's going to do well. Uh, and, and I also say real testing. So after you've done your virtual testing, obviously, and you feel confident and you build product, now you can actually do the real testing. And then failure analysis is something you do after that, which I'll, I'll discuss towards the end. So building a team. Um, prioritize DFR. May, you know, make it part of your culture that you're going to design products in a reliable manner. And the challenges that come in, um, sometimes you have design teams that are, you know, just electrical, mechanical engineers, which are trained in the science of success. What that means is they, they're constantly thinking of how to make the product um, they're trying to give it the features and function that they want the user to, to experience. 
and not necessarily are they thinking about all the ways it can fail. They're thinking of the positive aspects of the product, which is good too, but, but you need somebody who's looking at it from the standpoint of how can this thing fail and uh, what can we do to prevent that. Um, sometimes it involves rely, involving the reliability engineers and, and, uh, and modeling tools and other things. So what members should be involved? We've got component engineering, uh, physics of failure experts, uh, materials types of experts, might be uh, failure analysis experts. Uh, manufacturing engineers come into play, especially with your design for manufacturing. Systems engineers, uh, environmental legislation engineers, which these days is more and more important because there's a lot of new legislation. Thermal, make sure it can handle power requirements and then finally the reliability engineer and it's not just a you know some reliability engineers are just test guys and you don't necessarily want that. You want somebody who understands physics of failure and, and understands how products um, uh, behave in, in user environments. All right, well, this, well, why is wear out more important today? Well, I, I put this, this this chart together. It kind of shows that, you know, the, what it's showing here is the bathtub curve. Okay, I think you're all familiar with that, where you have your early failures from basically from quality defects, and then you have a constant failure rate followed by actual wear out of the product. And, uh, you know, in the early days, 1960s through 80s, um, products were built that w in, in a manner where the quality was not as good, but if it survived, they did very well. So they had like, let's say, two micron spaces on an IC. Um, you know, if if you didn't have defects in the dielectric, um, th this thing would survive for a very, very long time. Um, however, the processes weren't in control in a manner that would prevent such defects, and so they did things like burn-in and other things, other ways to try to weed out those uh, quality defects. Um, you know, we had P-dips, you know, through-hole components and um, and so on. And, and, and so it tended to be the situation where if it survived, they, they did very well. Uh, it's different today. Now we've, we've come along with very high-tech equipment for producing products. We have Six Sigma methodologies uh, ingrained in, in process engineers. We, we build products pretty well. Um, everything from ICs to components to circuit board assembly. Um, where we're seeing more issues now is the wear out. We're, we're designing products at, the, at or near the limits of the materials being used in them. We're, you know, we're getting into uh, tens of nanometers of dielectric thickness between conductors and you know over time that's just going to wear out. Uh, we're having solder joints that are smaller and smaller and over time are just going to fail. But we're putting vias closer and closer together. Uh, we're, we're doing things that uh, like I say are limiting are, are going to wear out. These are things the good part about this is quality issues are hard to predict. Uh, wear out mechanisms, however, can be predicted and can be modeled. And, and that's where we'll be getting in, you know, in, into some of the modeling I'll talk about in a minute here. Okay, how do things wage and wear out? Kind of put together, a, uh, a colleague put together this, this slide deck or this cartoon or illustration that shows everything see the load. There's various types of loads. They can be thermal, mechanical, chemical, and so on. Um, and every load creates a stress, and that stress creates a strain. You know, again, whether it's a mechanical or electrical or, or uh, might even be corrosion. And that creates damage accumulation over time. Um, and that eventually leads to failure. Uh, different location, different types of failures, but uh, failure nonetheless. And, and these are things that can be um, calculated and predicted. You know, once you understand 
the input variables um, for these types of failures. You can create Weibull plots and so on and, and understand what uh, and, and model those. So what are some wear out examples? Just listed a few and of course there's many more but things like ceramic capacitors, uh, the dielectric thicknesses are getting very low or very small and uh, you can start to see you know, oxygen vacancy migrations and other things that cause dielectric breakdown. Electrolytic capacitors, you can think of the evaporation of the electrolyte, um, dielectric dissolution, these sorts of things. Uh, corrosion failures, silver platings, PCBs, all kinds of things that can happen with corrosion uh, over time. Um, relays, electrical me mechanical components, these things just simply wear out over time. Uh, integrated circuits. You know, they used to be circuits would, you know, ICs would last easily 20 plus years. Now with the, with the cutting edge, uh, high density circuits, we're, we're down to sometimes three to five years of life on some of these. Uh, and the PCBs themselves, plated through hole fractures, uh, solder joint fractures, these are things that, that uh, occur in the actual printed circuit board assembly. Um, just one example of those is solder joints. I mean, again, in, in, in the past we had through holes. Everything was through hole. You know, very high reliability. Then we went to surface mount, QFPs, and there's a big stink about how that wasn't going to survive as, as well. Um, and then BGAs. Oh, and I remember all the, the fuss about it. BGAs could never survive the required life for products. Um, and then we did QFNs and uh, flip chips and CSPs and all these things. Each, each uh, advancement in technology uh, is done to create higher density, but pushes the limits of the materials, and and naturally we get um, lower reliability. Um, but the question always remains: is but is the reliability good enough? So solder joint wear out, uh, the extension of that is as you shrink your die, uh, I'm sorry, as a package size shrinks with respect to the die size, your coefficient of thermal expansion mismatch is, is uh, much larger. Uh, the point is it just by shrinking things down, you're putting more stress on solder joints and you can expect them to wear out uh, much faster. Uh, it's been said that uh, the majority of electronic failures are thermal mechanically related, whether this is you know, thermally induced strains from CT differences or diffusion-based issues where you're getting uh, you know, um, um, you know, high temperatures causing uh, um, failures. Um, th these things are important, and these things are things that can be can be modeled. So algorithms, there's been uh, lots of, of these different failure mechanisms <coughs> have an algorithm associated with them, um, incorporating various factors. Some of these are for temperature humidity tests and some are for dielectric breakdown, some are um, thermal cycle and, and so on. Um, and so the better we understand the failure mechanisms uh, and can uh, attribute an algorithm to them, the better chance we have of modeling those. Okay, computer modeling. So this is the best, best method to leverage all the previous work that's been done with these algorithms. Um, we have currently already have modeling tools for things like thermal modeling, circuit board layouts, electrical parameters, uh, FDA for you know for to create stress strain type plots, uh, and it's already known that OEMs that use these such design analysis tools are able to shorten their their uh, development time considerably. So as we uh, move into this new age, it's uh, it's working smarter, not just harder. I mean, we had used to be, of course, we had this agrarian-based uh, economy where everybody toiled in the fields and 
hunted and so on. Then we got into the Industrial Revolution. Um, and then the information age, and now we're into the, you know, the new age of you know, maker. Or, or many call it the creative age, where we're basically having the ability to produce products on an individual basis, almost. Um, whether it's hardware, or 3D printing, and so on. Um, point is that the the future will be will be modeled. The more the better understandings we have and the better computing power we have, the more we can uh, model things without having to build them. And one example is the uh, automotive industry. They have uh, made great strides in this area in all many different areas of, of engineering, from uh, vehicle structure, uh, safety, uh, thermal, aerodynamics, durability, noise, vibration, uh, all these things. They can, they can pretty do a pretty good job modeling. And as they do more and more of this, you know, crash testing, for example, you can do that uh, with uh, some pretty advanced modeling uh, programs. And with that, they can eliminate much of the physical testing that they had to do. And so, in this one example, um, you know, GM has been closing down a lot of their test grounds. They used to have these huge areas uh, built around um, testing vehicles um, and, and crashing them and so on. And they uh, are basically able to eliminate m much of that with uh, modeling. So modeling of electronics um, with Sherlock. Sherlock is uh, the name of a computer modeling tool that uh, we created at DFR Solutions. It's uh, uh, what it does is it performs finite element analysis of a fully assembled board mounted in, in the product enclosure. So this is uh, really the first time you could take a whole board with all of the components and, uh, and easily run uh, a finite element analysis and calculate the reliability of that product um, from you know, taking into account various failure mechanisms. So we, you know, we're, we're now getting into an age where the electronics can be tested virtually and virtually put into service uh, before any physical samples are built. You can have a good understanding of how that product is going to perform um, in shipping and storage and field use um, uh, be, before you've built anything. Therefore, you've, obviously, you can make design changes early. So what are the areas that it looks for? Um, failure mechanisms, like the covers, things like thermal cycling um, of, of uh, solder joints. So I thermal cycle the product virtually. I can tell you which solder joints are going to fail and, and when. Uh, plated through hole ferrule failures, you know, barrel cracking. Uh, as you get expansion of a board during thermal cycling, you can stress the copper vias. And this will help predict those those failures. Vibration and shock. So if the, your board is going to be mounted in a chassis in certain places on the board, mounted mount points, um, you shake and maybe drop that thing, you'll we'll be able to predict how much strain is exerted on the solder joints. Conductive ionic filament formation. This is a type of corrosion uh, that can that can occur metal migration that can uh, short out boards. You can do things with FMEA and uh, we also have MTBF calculations in the software for folks that want to do that. All right, so data import, this is an important part of this. Uh, the software is that, is that it's really easy to get data into the model. Um, most uh, electrical designers, they design the board, uh, you, you Various uh, software uh, tools are used for that, but oftentimes it can be exported in Gerber, and even better, these ODB++ files, which have all the information, the components, the location of the components, the pad sizes, the via holes, the mount points, everything is in that one file. We can import that into the software, and uh, 
and, and make minor corrections like what is the laminate, you know, identify the laminate material, uh, make sure the number of layers they have are uh, correct. Um, the, 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 we can then look at all the mechanical properties of that PCB laminate, and, and those all come into play to help determine the reliability of the product. The components also, there's a huge library of components that this uh, mines, and, uh, and so when you're inputting, or when the uh, components come in with your ODB file, uh, they'll be identified as you know, surface mount, capacitors, resistors, uh, various IC packages, and, uh, and all the characteristics of those are automatically determined. Um, and you can go in there and change those if you like. If, the, if you're using any unusual pad size on your capacitors, for example, you can change that pad size and it'll take that into account when, when calculating. Okay, the defining the durability and reliability objectives. So you want to tell the software how much, what do you expect for the service life of the product? And what do you consider to be a, an, an acceptable failure rate at the end of that service life? You know, I, Highly reliable product might be you know less than one percent. A, uh, a consumer product might be might be higher. And then uh, you have different life cycle phases. You know you might want to model your product in the you know through qualification testing or perhaps ESS uh, testing. Uh, transportation of the product to the to the to the customer. Uh, and then of course life in the field, whatever that field uh, entails. And, um, and that field life, th these are all the things that you can insert. You can put in mechanical shock, uh, thermal cycle profiles, whatever you think the product's going to see, uh, random vibration, you know, uh, harmonic vibration. Uh, all these can be inserted, uh, and it'll, it'll calculate the reliability of your printed circuit board assembly based on those, on those inputs. You can also take into account uh, transportation. So, uh, some people have done a pretty good job of, you know, putting thermocouples and accelerometers into into some of their packages and sending them various routes across the across the world and and uh, therefore get a you know some estimates of of what the products see and and these can also be inserted into your transportation type of uh, you know to ensure you have reliability products to make it through this transportation phase. All right, uh, test and field conditions. So I talk about uh, uh, thermal cyclic vibration, mechanical shock. These are the key ones. And then uh, I just want to make a point that thermal cycling can be fairly complex. Um, it's not just a, my product's going to see 20 to 40 C once every day. It's you may have a, a, an environment where um, it, it's maybe in a solar panel um, in, a, in a desert someplace, or it's even worse, a solar panel in Minnesota here. And, and you can say, well, in January, the temperatures are going to be, you know, range from minus 30 to, to, to zero, you know, every day, whatever it might be. You can put in your diurnal worst case temperature cycles and, um, and, and model those. Uh, FEA, fine element analysis mesh, uh, is pretty, is fairly automated, so you don't need to be some uh, FEA modeling expert to run this stuff. Um, it assumes certain mesh sizes, and you can change those, but uh, what it has defaulted to are usually pretty, pretty good estimates. And then, uh, from that, you can calculate things like the natural. It, it will calculate for you. Find out the natural frequencies of the of the board, and so you may have different harmonics, different natural frequencies for that board, uh, based on where the mount points are located, based on the stiffness of the board naturally, and uh, and let's kind of show some examples of that. And then you can make changes if your board. You know, typically you want to see natural frequencies are on the higher end. You know, a few hundred hertz would be nice. 
um, if your values tend to be relatively low, um, like in the, the plot on the left, we're at 143 hertz as a natural frequency, and we're creating a lot of deflection in an area that with a, a, a sensitive component, we may decide to add a mount point. Um, and if we do, what happens? Well, we, we've increased the natural frequency to almost 180 hertz. We've moved the deflection point uh, to another area, which maybe not doesn't have as uh, fragile of components. So these are things you can do um, virtually without having to build product. And of course, you can learn a lot uh, doing this. And they have a so when you lay out the board, you can do it in a more um, educated manner. Um, we just recently included 3D modeling. So now we can model these boards in you know, a three-dimensional manner, much more uh, effective. You can do things like, uh, in this one uh, example here, we, you have a, a large high-mass transformer on, on this board. Let's say you're designing this board and you're wondering, well, where's the best place to put this transformer to, uh, to meet certain reliability requirements that I'm going to have in the field, you know, vibration type of requirements. Um, you can you can play around with it. You can move it in different spots and and rerun the analysis and and figure out uh, how many cycles to failure you would expect uh, on that board. And so you can therefore optimize the life of the product by where you end up putting that that transformer. And so you know these uh, in this case we had this big edge connector which was you know, stiffened the board considerably, and if you put the transformer closer to that, uh, of course, you, you would get less bending of the board and less failure of some of the other of the other components. And uh, from a vibration standpoint, it'll actually provide a, all the components on the board, and but list them in the order of maximum strain, the strain that they're going to see, um, because you know. I've obviously, the solder joints that see the, ma the higher strain are the ones that are most uh, uh, susceptible to failure. And it'll actually give you the expected uh, time to failure. I mean, so these are mean time to failure uh, numbers. And then uh, shock. Let's talk about shock. There's lots of profiles you can put in for shock, and it'll, of course, um, virtually model your board in the chassis, uh, in those shock, uh, in that shock environment, and then tell you again which components are going to see the highest strain when you undergo a whatever shock pulse you you put on that board, um, and then we'll rank them in in order. Typically, these the red means it's at risk. Yellow is moderate risk. Green means it's okay, no problems. Thermal cycling. There's lots of uh, um, you, primarily the modified Ingelmeyer uh, equations have been used. Um, however, it's you know there have been some modifications depending on whether it's tin lead or tin silver copper solder. Uh, it also it does take into account you know, the lead length, the size of the solder, of, of the pad that you're bonding to, um, stiffness of the board, obviously, the stiffness and CTs of the packages and and uh, boards and so on. So all these things are taken into account um, when, when performing the thermal cycle analysis. And then it will provide a final output is a failure curve or you know, a cumulative failure curve. So you would expect in this particular case have roughly 3% product failure after 10 years from thermal cycle of solder joints. And you can run this with uh, lead-free solder, tin lead, uh, and some others. And then it'll also give you, a, again, list out the components in order of damage. So if you have some components that are higher risk of failure, 
Uh, it'll give you, again, your expected time to failure, uh, but it'll also give you your um, cumulative failure curve and let you know if you're going to meet your desired lifetime and failure rate. Plated through hole reliability, this is done as well. It's looking at uh, you know, the thickness of the board, the z-axis expansion, uh, copper thickness, quality of the of the via plating. These things all come into play and uh, are used to help calculate the, the life. And m much of those calculations are based on IPC TR579, which is a, a pretty detailed analysis that took into account lots of these different variables. And so again, it'll provide a cumulative failure curve or plated through hole failure um, in the thermal cycle environment that, that you prescribe. And then uh, you, know, you can run all these analysis of these various failure mechanisms and then it'll, it'll add them up. You know, it'll plot each one individually uh, for example, I mentioned earlier, it, it will run an MTBF of just the components if you ask it to do that. Um, and then it'll add the failure rate from uh, plated through holes, from thermal cycling of the solder joints on the board, fatigue, wear out, uh, and it can then add them all together. And so you can see what your overall failure rate is and what contributes to that and therefore make any changes that, that you need to change. Yeah, that you uh, that you want to make. Um, conductive anionic filament formation. Let's change gears a little here. This is another failure mechanism I mentioned earlier. It's uh, metal migration within the board, and primarily along the fiber bundles. And it it occurs when the vias tend to get too close. They're drilled too, you know, fairly close together. And the drilling is such that it can disturb the fibers and allow a little pathway. And so if you have a, a, enough voltage potential between those vias, you can start to drive uh, copper migration and essentially create a, a copper tube that can short these out. Uh, so variables that are important are distance between the vias, you know, damage from the drilling process, uh, temperature humidity conditions, voltage differentials. Um, uh, these things all come into play. And then what the software will do, we'll just look at all the vias on your board and say, hey, how many of these are considered to be too close? And, and uh, it may be okay if they're the same potential, for example, it's fine. Or if you're going to uh, say conformally coat your board, you may decide it, that it's, it's a non-risk. Um, so there are various, it at least gives you uh, uh, the heads up. So what other uses are there for the model? You can use Sherlock in a lot of different ways. Um, <clears throat> one is to determine the proper thermal cycle test requirements. So you may have a product that sees all kinds of funky thermal cycles in, in, in its use environment. And so then you're wondering, uh, how do I test for this? What's the appropriate accelerated light test to simulate a, uh, a solar panel in the, de in the, in the desert? <clears throat> and so I'll, I'll show you how to do that. Uh, modify mount point locations. You might want to have a better understanding of your ESS conditions. Uh, what happens with uh, when you move components or replace them? Uh, changing lead, you know, solder from tin lead to lead free. Uh, expected warranty costs. You can help better select PCB laminates to make sure that that you're uh, specking them properly. Maybe even not over specking them. So, uh, modeling a, 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 an appropriate test. This is just one example. So you might have uh, a solar panels and a in the Phoenix Desert, and they may see this uh, these unusual diurnal cycles. Um, you can figure out from the modeling how much damage occurs, let's say, in 10 years in that desert environment. 
and the model will give you that. And then you say, well, what if I want to test these things from minus 40 to 85 as an accelerated test? How much damage does that give me? And again, you can calculate that. And then you can say, well, all right, then it's basically 222 cycles and that accelerated test will simulate 10 years in, the, in that desert environment. So now I have a better feel for how much I should test the, the, uh, the product to in an, an accelerated format. Um, so that can come in handy. Stress screening, this is for high reliable products, many times for the medical industry, where you want to just weed out any, any weak uh, or poorly made products. But you don't want to stress them to a point where you're using up too much useful life. And usually five to ten percent is is your is your max. So again, the modeling will help make sure that you don't do that. We also have instances where maybe you want to put a key, you know, the design is a QFN in this particular case, and we say, well, that's fine, but the QFN is not going to meet your requirements um, as is. So if we replace it with, say, a QFP. Um, type of package, then then you're in great shape. Again, this is something that can be done without having to, before you've built the board, so it's much easier. Uh, tin lead versus lead free, you do see differences and sometimes it's better, sometimes it's worse, and that, honestly it depends on the uh, types of components being used and the stiffness of the board and, and, and the, 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 those types of factors. Uh, laminate selection. This is a busy chart, but really the main point is, look, you can put in lots of different laminates, run them through your uh, environmental expectations, and determine which one meets your requirements. You can you know, obviously rank them according to their quality, or their, not quality, but their ability in, uh, to, to meet the requirements. And you may, you may decide you don't need the Cadillac uh, laminate. Uh, the, the, the modeling may show you that an intermediate laminate is good enough and you can save some money. So, Validation of the model. This is, uh, we, we, we've run a lot of testing uh, or um, taken data from the literature for various types of packages and you know where, where they tell you this is a type of, this is a laminate we use, this is the BGA this is the details for that BGA. We can enter that into the into the model and determine um, the model reliability and compare that to the actual. And that's what this is. This chart is showing. Uh, each one of these represents a different paper and a different BGA in that paper. And the modeling you can see is real is pretty accurate. It's uh, within a roughly ten percent of of actual results. So it. Uh, models pretty pretty well. Uh, we've done this for chip resistors, QFNs, uh, QFPs, all kinds of other packages. And so this is just our way of validating that the, the modeling is, is pretty accurate. All right, physics of failure reliability testing. How, how, how do the two go together? Well, uh, we would talk about physics of failure and what that is, uh, but it's using that to help design tests that are more appropriate that really tell you that your product is going to do well in the, in the intended use environment. Uh, too often times people just take industry standard tests and, and put them in play and, and uh, sometimes they're good but sometimes they're just not appropriate. Um, and there's different types of tests. There's feasibility tests that might be done you know, real early in the proof of concept stage. Uh, medical industry may have a lot of validation verification tests. These are things where you have to conform to a certain spec or standard, and sometimes not a lot of leeway with those. You just have to do them. Um, and then there's production tests, you know, and things you do to optimize your processes or ensure your product is is uh, is a, is high quality before leaving the factory. Um, reliability tests. These are the ones we'll focus most on, because this is what, when you're testing products, usually to failure, testing them to make, to understand their capabilities and ability to withstand user environments and to reveal any weaknesses. 
Okay, so the critical first step is understanding the user environment. Everything from shipping to use, what's it going to see, and even the corner cases. Because rarely do people use things in the way that you intend. Um, we've had, uh, you know, I've worked at Dell. I mean, I was always amazed at the places people use computers. You know, you, you, you build them for office environments, but you'll find them in, uh, uh, in an old barn running uh, uh, automated cow milking. You, you, you'll see them running in, in mine, mine shafts uh, or, you know, industrial environments all over the place. And so you either create your product or develop it to withstand such things or um, you clearly lay out what the limits of the product are. So if people use them in those environments, it's, it's their risk. Um, data. You have, uh, you know, obviously better if you have actual data for all these various environments. Um, use of physics and failure principles to create effective reliability tests. So this, this uh, just, um, you know, a lot of it is going from history, understanding how things have failed in the past, uh, good literature searches, Consult experts in your field to have a good understanding of how things are expected to fail. And then uh, use test methods that simulate the stressors, whatever those stressors are. Um, and test at the various levels. You may have component level testing, board level testing, system level testing. These are all important areas, uh, determining the pass-fail criteria and really clearly specifying that is also key and, and hopefully it doesn't just say it passes electrical functionality because many tests will pass functionality but there'll be a ton of damage internal to the board. You may even have fractured traces that are still touching and so it, it, it functions but obviously would be a uh, intermittent type failure in the field. So performing some amount of analytical FA afterwards is highly recommended to understand what damage has occurred as a result of the test. This gives you a quick list of uh, failure-inducing loads, some examples, everything from cycling to corrosion to you know, shock and vibration. Now, these are all things that products can see in the field. Um, just another example of shipping conditions and vibration they may see. Humidity, uh, moisture, rules of thumb. I mean, if you, your products are going to see various levels of moisture, certainly on the condensing or standing water, that's where things like conformal coatings and those sorts of things come into play. Um, and I mentioned earlier, you want to do testing at the component qual level, uh, PCBA, so the assembly, the actual board level qual and then the system level. Now, so after you mount that board into a system or chassis, uh, there's certain types of tests that need to be done. So develop a comprehensive test plan. Uh, assemble the boards at your optimal conditions. Sometimes it's good to rework some of those components if, if that's expected to happen in, in real life. Um, visually inspect and electrically test Perform your various tests uh, of the of the boards and reworked boards, um, and then uh, perform failure analysis. You know whether they pass or not. Again, I think it's important to to run uh, a good analysis of those, and that's what this is meant to uh, to illustrate. Okay. Uh, and so, yeah, perform failure analysis on good samples, sure, because, um, like I said earlier, you can have functional you know, tests. You may have products that pass functionality but still have a lot of physical damage, um, and pad cratering is just one example of that, where you can have a lot of uh, pads tearing out of the, of the laminate, and they'll still function. Um, however, it's a good indication that you're probably going to get failure very soon. In fact, you may have some that are already cracked, uh, like in this case on the right, 
where uh, they're still touching and so you may it may still function and then uh, the last slide here is for component level DFR um, just wanted to show some examples of component failure mechanisms that, that should be considered when designing electronics these are things that you know honestly each one of these could be a, a, a half hour presentation um, so it'll just kind of what's your appetite, but things like tin whiskers, you know, making sure you're using the proper risk mitigation techniques uh, when incorporating tin plated uh, components. Uh, corrosion, uh, you know, silver on resistors is one example. Um, you know, resistors when used in sulfur environments can corrode and, and fail over time. Uh, derating, you know, are you using the proper derating strategies for resistors and caps and other components. Uh, avoiding resistors that are greater than 500 K ohms, this is when you have boards that aren't very clean because you can start to get leakage across the board and and uh, it will circumvent these types of resistors. So sometimes you're better off using multiple smaller resistors in series. Um, connectors. You know, making sure they have the, the proper plating materials. So if you're using gold, how thick is the gold? How many insertion withdrawal cycles are you going to have? Um, is it tin? You know, that, do you have you know, fretting concerns of, because of micro vibration and so on? These are, again, this is a, uh, an area that, you know, takes a lot of, uh, of study and analysis. PCB laminates, are they rated properly, especially for the lead-free environments? And uh, are you using the right surface finishes on those PCBs? Because uh, that, the, the right one will depend on the application. And uh, you can get, you know, possibility for corrosion, brittle fracture, manufacturability issues. All these things come into play depending on which surface finish you, you use. Uh, Multilayer ceramic caps. These are vulnerable to a mechanical fracture. They're near the edges of, of boards or thermal shock cracking if, you know, if, if they are heated or cooled too quickly. So, again, these are just all various things uh, to be aware of as well. And to summarize, uh, physics of failure is here to stay. We will uh, continue to get a better understanding of what drives failure mechanisms uh, as, as you know, more and more studies are done. Uh, the algorithms, we're getting better, smarter. Uh, they're getting more sophisticated and, and, and accurate. And as they do so, the modeling capability will become better and more accurate as well. And Sherlock modeling, it's a, you know, the tool is a great way to provide a, a glimpse anyways, a good feel for how your design is going to perform um, in the actual product or in the actual user environment. And you know, the ability to do this before you actually build anything is, is great leverage. It allows you to design the product properly up front and save a lot of time and effort and cost. Um, more effective reliability testing is accomplished uh, you know, with, you know, by using physics of failure concepts. So when you're designing your test plan, um, have a good understanding of what stressors are being activated in the user environment to make sure you're emphasizing those when in creating your tests. So um, that's all I have for, for this presentation. I'm happy to take any questions. Uh, I think there's a, this little question uh, box down here if, if folks want to ask any questions. Right, if you have any questions, uh, there is a uh, questions box down uh, at the bottom of the viewing panel on the right. If you've minimized it, just go ahead and reopen eyes, uh, pull that out, um, <clears throat> and you'll see a way to ask questions. Uh, we've gone the, uh, the route of unmuting people to ask questions. Uh, that typically doesn't work very well. We get weird kinds of echoes and stuff. So what I'll be doing is uh, I'll be reading your questions uh, for a little bit. I think we have a, a limitation on time, uh, but I'll, we'll try to get through as many as possible. So uh, the first question uh, comes from Hannah Cohen, and this was asked a bit earlier. I think, Randy, you covered this, 
the question was, do you have any correlation data between failure prediction and actual failure in field conditions? Uh, yeah, and, and the answer is, yeah, we, we've done a lot of correlation with uh, various types of packages and components. And uh, from, from a lot of the literature, uh, comparing those to what the model will provide, and it's, it's very, very close within, you know, in, uh, anywhere from 10 to 20 percent to uh, accuracy. Excellent. Uh, I've got another question from uh, Robert Buick. Uh, it's, uh, uh, do you have to enter the raw card Gerber data into the model, and how is this done in terms of, you know, board spacing and stuff like that? Um, I'm sorry. I think the question res uh, uh, revolves around how do you put the, the design information into the Sherlock tool? Ah, okay. Um, well, again, it, it's mostly from uh, use of ODB and Gerber files. So the design, a PCB designer will uh, have the option to export the results in a ODB file, and, and that imports directly into Sherlock and gives you uh, nearly all the information you need. Okay. Uh, for those of you who are looking for this presentation, uh, once we've uh, cleaned it up and posted it on our website. We'll be sending a link out to everybody that registered. Um, the next question um, is: How do you, how would you test the ability of a conformal coat to withstand cyclic humidity testing for design life of twenty to thirty years? Okay, a conformal coating. Um, with with conformal coatings, it. Uh, it, it'd be, uh, this is getting beyond the modeling aspect, but it's getting into the reliability, the testing aspect. Uh, it would be, I, I would think, to do some humidity uh, cycling. Temperature humidity cycling is something that can be done. And what you're trying to do is drive humidity either through the conformal coat or um, through the edges of the board. Because, uh, usually those are areas that are not covered by the conformal coating and moisture can uh, wick in the edges of the board and, and get to undesirable locations. Um, and so I can't tell you the acceleration factor off the top of my head, but there are ways to um, accelerate it with high, high humidity, uh, but then also to cycle that uh, through temperature and humidity cycling. Let's see. Um, do you have uh, do you have a board finish that you would most recommend for outdoor or automotive applications? Um, um, well, for many, uh, there's really two answers to that. One, the surface finish, and then there's conformal coating. Because honestly, many outdoor automotive applications are conformally coated. Um, a good board finish typically is something like a, a um, hassle, uh, a lead-free hassle is actually very resistant to environmental uh, you know, concerns. It doesn't, you know, tin and tin type platings don't concern, don't corrode very quickly. Um, others have tried ENIG, which is a uh, electros nickel immersion gold or any pig, you know, another version of that. Um, those are also pretty effective. They, 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 they look decent over time. Uh, conformal coatings, though, are probably the real answer, because that helps prevent uh, corrosion you know, from happening on, on the board itself, you know, across the board. And uh, silicones are pretty heavily used to prevent moisture. Um, so probably a silicone type coating is the most common for the, those types of a, uh, applications. So hopefully that answers it, at least as well as I can in, in a minute. All right, uh, I got uh, one here asking about acceleration testing uh, for polymeric materials uh, in the user environment. So I guess uh, acceleration testing of polymers? Uh, 
Thanks, um, I'm not sure. Uh, any acceleration test for polymeric materials used under Um, that's such a open question because um, with with polymers you have to worry about things like crazing, you know, micro cracks, and you're worried about things like solvents um, getting on the polymers and causing crazing or, or micro cracking. Um, and so when you're looking at DFR for those things, you really need to test um, to make sure you're testing your your polymers through any solvents that, that may come in contact with them. Um, and then, you know, there's, so there's that aspect of it. And then there's the whole mechanical aspect of, you know, is it going to see vibration and shock and so on and, and, uh, and, and testing polymers in that manner. Uh, polymers are more difficult than, frankly, than metals in that you don't get the same amount of cumulative damage in a, along a crack. And so oftentimes you actually actually have to test them at the uh, conditions you expect them to see or the worst case conditions. All right. Uh, I got uh, Timothy wants to know how we handle our component library, how comprehensive is it, and uh, how do we handle unique and custom components? Mm, good question. Well, uh, it, it, it's it's extensive and becoming more extensive every day because people add components to it. Uh, and so libraries can be shared um, between customers if, if desired. You don't have to. Um, and if you have a very unique component, you can create it uh, within Sherlock and it's not too difficult. You basically say here's the size, you know, physical dimensions. Here's the solder joint uh, pads, um, the material. You need to find what the material is so he knows what the CTE is and so on. And so it takes a little bit of time to create your own component, but not, you know, it might might take, you know, three or four minutes to an experienced user. And uh, and once it's created, it's it's in your library forever. So you can just pick it up and, you know, if, if you use it again. And so what you find is that 98% of the components that come in to the software are fine as is, you know, 402 capacitors and various BGAs and so on. Uh, and then there will be a, just a couple percent which are very unique and you need to, to modify. Okay. I see a question about... Have you about, modeled uh, BGA with a heat sink? Yeah, yeah. A, a heat sink and gap pad using Sherlock? Yeah. yeah. And, uh, and the answer is yes. We can model heat sinks on BGAs and, um, and also screwed to the board. So you may have a... a B, uh, and oftentimes the heat sinks are large and can be screwed to the board with you know, springs and so on, and uh, those can be those can be modeled as well. In fact, I'm working on a project right now that that has such a thing, and uh, and so the influence of that on the overall bending of the board is is taken into account. Okay, I think that's all the questions we have. Uh, thank you, everybody, for attending. Uh, well, like I said before, uh, once we clean up the presentation and post it on our website, uh, everybody who registered for the webinar will be receiving an email with a link uh, where they can view it online. Uh, thank you very much, and have a great day.